Welcome back to Principles of Microeconomic Theory with me, Dr. Craig Webb. In the last video, we looked at consumer demand, and in this video, we'll look at the other side of the market and analyze supply. So let's get started. When we talk about supply, we mean the amount of a good that a firm wants to sell, given the current market conditions. Notice that supply is not necessarily equal to what the firm actually sells. It may want to sell a lot more than it's currently able to, but perhaps consumers are not so interested in the product at its current price. Supply is the quantity the firm wants to sell. There are various things that could affect the firm's supply decision, so let's continue thinking about coffee as we did when we discussed demand. The supply of coffee, capital Q, is clearly going to be affected by the market price of coffee, P. Now, Farmers who grow coffee could instead use their land for growing cocoa, so perhaps the price of cocoa could affect supply too. Other factors affecting supply might include production costs, the firm's technology, government regulations, the time of year, and so on. Let's keep it simple for now and focus on these two price variables. To model supply, we use the idea of a supply function, which describes the mathematical relationship between relevant variables and the firm's supply. In this case, we suppose that supply is a function, capital S, of the price of coffee and the price of cocoa. The function S could take any form in general. Typically, we'll think of it being an increasing function of the market price. Here, we're going to work with a linear supply function, so something like Q is equal to E plus F times the price of coffee minus G times the price of cocoa, where E, F and G are positive parameters. We assume a plus sign here so that price increases lead to supply increases, and a minus sign here to capture the idea that if cocoa were to increase in price, then the firm will decrease its supply of coffee, presumably to sell cocoa instead. The parameters of this linear supply function can be estimated using econometric techniques. Suppose that we've done this and the estimated linear supply function is Q equals 9.6 plus 0.5 times the price minus 0.2 times the price of cocoa. If we're going to represent this supply function graphically, I suppose we could draw a three-dimensional diagram, but let's use the same idea that we used when drawing demand functions. We'll assume that the price of cocoa is fixed at a particular level, in this case, $3. Then you can calculate that the supply function is equal to Q equals 9 plus 0.5 times the price of coffee. You'll notice here that the linear specification has this constant term, which seems to suggest that if the price is zero, then the firm will supply nine to the market. Of course, we shouldn't take this too literally. If the price was zero, then of course the firm won't supply anything to the market. So this isn't perfectly accurate, but it may be fairly accurate within a certain region. Perhaps for prices between one and 10, for example, it might do very well. But when we get to the extremes, it may not do so well. Even though we think of supply as a function of price, Remember that we draw diagrams of these with price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. This is how we drew demand functions. So let's invert this expression to get P by itself. And this gives P equals two times Q minus 18. I suppose you could call this an inverse supply function, although I don't recall that term being used anywhere near as much as the term inverse demand. Anyway, as we fix the price of cocoa, this line represents the firm supply as a function of price alone, if we read it sideways, and we call this a supply curve, even though it's a straight line. Now this looks a little cramped, so I'm going to do a trick here and change the axis a bit. I'm just going to put this notch here to indicate a little break and rescale the axis a bit. This is so I can redraw the supply curve like this. That looks better for me. To interpret this supply curve, we're going to read across and then down. So if the price is two, then the quantity supplied to the market is 10. If the price is four, then the quantity supplied to the market is 11. If the price of the good increases from two to four, the quantity supplied changes, but the supply curve stays exactly where it is. 
We call this a movement along the supply curve. Now, to construct this supply curve, we took the price of cocoa as fixed at $3. So what happens if the price of cocoa changes? Well, suppose the price of cocoa increases from $3 to, say, $6. Then we can recalculate the supply curve and we get Q is equal to 8.4 plus 0.5 times the price. Inverting this to produce a diagram of the new supply curve gives the following. We see that on this new supply curve, the firm supplies less at all coffee price levels. The change in the price of cocoa has shifted the supply curve for coffee. The slope is the same, so it's a parallel shift, but the intercept with the price axis changed from negative 18 to negative 16.8. Summing up, changes in the price of coffee cause movements along the supply curve, changes in other variables cause shifts in the supply curve. Thanks for watching and take care.